Welcome to part two of making an Australian bustle gown based on my designs that were inspired by a Charles Worth gown in the Met and a pattern that I found in Janet Arnold's Patterns of Fashion. I also looked in newspaper archives from Australia of the time. I looked at anything for society that was going on. I looked at original photographs of the time. All the links are below. I looked at extant garments from the Brighton Historical Society and other sources such as family archives. So I started on the mock-up in the previous video and created a pattern so I was ready to go and start designing my dress. I used the mock-up to place the darts on the cut-out pattern which I had extended a little lower in the waist. So I have cut out my pattern pieces. I've noticed from the fabulous Abby Cox that a lot of the historical garments are with a brown sateen lining. I couldn't quite get the same brown, but I could get this color sateen and pinned them together and then started to flat line the pieces together. So just going around the edge, this is something that I have learned from Bernadette Banner. I'm a self-taught sewer, so I up until now had just pinned everything together and sewn away and hoped that everything will be good. So I'm hoping now, and I have noticed now since I've been in putting some of these techniques into practice that my sewing is a hundred times better. I found when I was stitching the darts I had to be quite careful because they're quite curvy and not as straight up and down as modern pattern darts. I've clipped all the seams in this garment with pinking shears just to be safe and then felled them down as well so I'm doubly sure that they're not going to fray. I've opened up all the seams with the iron and clipped the curves to make sure they sit nice and flat. I was now ready to fit the bodice to the mannequin which was given to me by the lovely Blaze at Vintage Rose in Brighton, links below, which was really kind of her and I was able to get that proper silhouette using my corset and a shaped mannequin. I started with the placard for the back which is just a strip reinforced with the sateen and I have made sure that I have continued to use the same fabric throughout to keep an equal strength. I also want to note at this stage that I pretty much do everything in a dressing gown because, hell, I've been in lockdown in, for a year and a half in some of the strongest conditions in the world and dressing well is optional so everything is done in a dressing gown and you can just live with it because I love it. I'm attaching the placard to the back where the hooks and bars will do up the bodice and I'm doing it listening to one of my favorite history YouTubers and I generally like to listen to documentaries while I'm sewing. I've measured out three centimeter strips on the bias of the alternative purple fabric and I'm going to use those to finish the top and the bottom of the bodice. 
Using the bias strips, I enclosed a piece of ordinary cotton string into the strip and sewed with the zigzag foot really, really close to the edge. There's no need to buy specialist piping for any of your projects, just make your own. It's much cheaper and easier and the piping will match exactly. Then I just attached the piping to the bodice, right sides to right sides, so I could then turn it out. Now it was time to think about trimmings, and I've got a fairly considerable stash, and quite a lot of it is vintage lace. So I chose some from the vintage and antique lace that I have and bought others, then put it all in a mix of about three or four different dyes so I could get the right colour, heating them and then leaving them overnight. And because they're cotton and not synthetic, you can dye them fairly successfully in hot water but do allow for shrinkage. It's at this stage where I gave everything an additional press to press down where I had added the piping which in the different colour just looked great. I was really pleased with it and making sure all the seams were flat. Yeah. To start on the Bertha collar, I got a large piece of bias cut fabric in the alternate colour and pressed it ready to stitch the seam. I then sewed it in half with the edges together to create a top stitch on both the top and bottom edges. For the closures, I have some packets of antique hooks and bars or hooks and eyes, whichever you want to call them. I then use these to attach to the placard on both sides so I could get a nice even closure all the way along. I've been researching Victorian trims and decided that Enough is never enough. In fact, more is more when it comes to Victorian garments. So I added a tube of gathered trim either side of the closure because the back would be slightly open to allow for a pleated peplum to be sticking out. I've just realised that I had forgotten to film stitching the boning into the major seams which were felled into place. I hand stitched on the bertha just underneath the piping line. It made a nice clean and easier way to get an even edge. I hand stitched on the lace underneath where the bertha was connected just to make sure I was happy with the positioning and then I went back later and stitched it down properly so it was nice and secure. Every evening gown needs a bit of bling so I added strings of crystal to the front in three different rows, one hanging a little bit longer than each of the other. I then added the pleat which went in at the center back to hang over the back bustle as a kind of peplum of sorts. I decided that I needed to add some more sparkle 
over the top of the sleeve so when your arm goes through it hangs with a little hint of the sparkle over the top of your upper arm. Finally, because enough is never enough, I added some seed beads to the back seams and also in certain places on the bertha where I'd gathered it up just to give that little bit extra of a nighttime feel to the garment. Then it was done and I was pretty happy with the result. Let me know what you think and um, look forward to the next video which is making the skirt and the front and back panels.